What is going on everybody? Lamont at large. Today I am in West Des Moines, Iowa and we're going to talk about the Johnny Gosh disappearance. Uh, he's been missing for over 40 years now and there's some aspects of this case that is quite unusual, uh, quite odd, quite weird to say the least. Uh, without further ado, let's get right into it. That right there in the center of your screen is the house where the Gosh family used to live at. So this is a cul-de-sac right here, only one way in and one way out, and it is right there. So we're gonna follow the trail of where Johnny Gosh, 12 years of age, on September 5th, 1982, disappeared. So on that very early morning, maybe about uh, 5, 5.30 or so, Johnny wakes up, it's Saturday, and guess what? Like a lot of boys his age, you got a paper route. And still some responsibility. You got a little part-time job, make a couple bucks, you know, so you have money to buy baseball cards, comics, whatever it is that you want to do. Sometimes Johnny's dad would take him on the route um, in his car just to kind of, you know, help him out, maybe spend some father-son time. Uh, sometimes he would do that, sometimes he wouldn't do that. Maybe it depends on how he felt. So on that morning, maybe dad was sleeping. I don't know. So Johnny gets his red wagon and he drags it from his house right there down this hill. He's probably walking in the street. Nobody's up. Very, very quiet. And he makes a right onto Marcourt. And the reason why we're making this right is because we're gonna go to the location where other newspaper boys in the area, uh, they're gonna meet the guy or the guys that have a truck or a van or whatever. They're bringing in the newspapers from the newspaper company who's publishing it. And then the kids would pick up the newspapers and then you normally would have a route. Uh, these houses right here, might have been Johnny's route. Um, don't quote me on it. I'm pretty sure they try to do the routes as quickly to the uh, kid's address as possible. Now, as Johnny's walking up the street right here, he's not alone. He has his little dashing dog with him. I don't know if he brought the dog along with him or the dog followed him. I don't know, I wasn't there but he was with his dog walking up this uh, street right here. He's gonna meet the guy or the guys, whoever that has the van and the truck with the newspapers to give to the kids so they could do their route. It's gonna be this church over on the other side of this house right here. Now, before we get to the newspaper pickup location, there's lots of stories of, and unfortunately of kids disappearing, coming up missing worse things than that the reason why i picked this story is because there's some very i'm just going to call it the way i see it very weird aspects of this case uh very unusual so we're rounding the corner right now and we're walking up upon a church where he would get his newspapers johnny arrives at this church uh maybe it's about 10 after 6 now or so so I'm pretty sure there's going to be other kids uh, hanging out in this parking lot that are waiting for whoever is bringing the newspapers to come by, drop them off so they can do their route. And uh, Johnny's probably just talking to uh, whatever other kids in the area that are doing the same job that he did. So he pulls his red wagon up to the spot somewhere right here. Don't know exactly where, but this is the parking lot. And he gets his newspapers. I don't know how many newspapers he got. I don't know how long it takes him to do his uh, route. I'm sure it doesn't take much longer than a couple hours. That's about it. You know, make a couple bucks. He loads up his wagon with the newspaper. And according to a few kids that had an interaction with Johnny that morning, his dog, again, is with him. He takes his newspapers and proceeds to leave the church. 
Before Johnny left this parking lot where the church is located, one of the other kids that was talking to him had earlier seen Johnny talking to a person that was in a automobile, not sure what the make or the model was, but it was described as a two-tone blue colored car. Now maybe the kid is making small talk with him, whatever he says, hey, who was that? And Johnny says, oh, that guy was just asking for directions. So as Johnny is walking on the very sidewalk where I'm at right now, he walks to this exact intersection. We're on 42nd and Marquardt, just not even barely a block from the church. And according to eyewitnesses, Johnny is standing right here, right on the intersection of 42nd and Marquardt. A silver car comes up to him and they hear a car door slam and the car's gone. I don't know what happens to the dog, but his wagon with his newspapers are right here on this very street corner. Now, some of you might be old enough to remember when the newspaper was pretty damn important. Uh, newspapers back in the days were to me what a cell phone is now. You want information, you need information, and the newspaper provided all of that and more. So by at least 7 o'clock, 7.30, maybe 8 at the latest, these houses right here, they should have a newspaper right on their doorstep well as close to the doorstep as you can get it by eight o'clock now there's some unhappy customers they don't have their newspapers because the damn newspaper boy must have overslept so they start calling the newspaper company and they're saying where the hell is my newspaper i don't see my newspaper blah 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 so they figure out whose route this is. It's Johnny's. And their newspapers are not delivered as promised with their subscription. So eventually they call Johnny's house and his parents, they get uh, greeted by a phone call from the company saying, yeah, hey, uh, where's Johnny? He didn't deliver his newspapers. They don't know he's supposed to you know, go do what his job is, deliver the newspapers. So after that, uh, they get in the car and then they start driving up and down this street right here uh, looking for their kid. It was John and Noreen Gosh. And I'm assuming that 42nd and Marquardt, right over there, they see his wagon with the newspapers Again, I don't know where the dog is, but uh, they don't see their kid. Immediately, they call the West Des Moines Police Department. Uh, West Des Moines is right next to Des Moines, of course, in case nobody knows that doesn't live out this way. So they call the police and listen, back in those days, and it, you know, it's a shame to say this, but oftentimes when kids would run away, it wasn't taken that seriously as it is now. Because oftentimes kids fight. They get mad at their parents, especially when they're 13, 14. You start becoming a teenager. Your hormones are going crazy. You want to go visit that girl. You want to go visit that boy. Mom said no. Dad said you're grounded. And oftentimes kids, as you know, a lot of you out there have, can be quite defiant. So they're attributing Johnny's disappearance to him just being a, an adolescent boy. And I don't know, maybe they got into an argument. I don't know. I don't know if they, if there was an argument in the family, I have no idea. But they're like, eh, you know, they didn't take it seriously. At least until either later on that afternoon or the following day. Whatever the case might be, now you have the next day, September 6th, 1982, and he is nowhere to be found. And I'm sure they're calling all of uh, his friends and 
uh, uh, family members that might live in and around the area and nobody's seen him. This kid, he's totally disappeared. And often, as I unfortunately say in some of my stories, days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months, and months turn into years. What happened to Johnny Gosh? Parents are going crazy. Mom and dad are looking in fields and gutters and you're thinking the worst for your child. He was last seen wearing a white sweatshirt. So every time his dad would pass some kind of a ditch or ravine or something like that, he's looking for something that's white. Maybe that's my kid. He's lying dead in, a, in the grass somewhere. Somebody killed him. And Johnny was one of the first three kids uh, whose image was used on the back of milk cartons. I don't know if anybody out there remembers that, but I most certainly do. They don't do it anymore, but they used to when I was a kid. And he's gone. Now, here's where the story takes a, a really, really weird turn. Now, you're going to get these characters who need attention who are bored who want to just muddle and in investigations for some unknown reason attention seeking uh, i don't know why they do these things you be the judge of what really took place it has been now over five years since johnny's been missing he's appeared on millions of milk cartons flyers newspapers all across the nation news reporters have done stories continuously about what happened to johnny gosh and it's like he literally walked off the face of the planet in 1988 the fbi started using this new uh, facial aging technology to show people what he could possibly look like if he were alive at that time they're basically taking pictures of the mom and the dad, uh, seeing how Johnny, who he looks like most. And of course, you're looking more at the parent who most looks like him. And you're trying to guess what he would possibly look like getting pictures of the parents when they were a certain age, close to age, as Johnny would be if he were still alive at that point in time. So we got one pedo weirdo paul benassi so in 1991 this guy is in prison i want to say he's in prison in nebraska uh, for being a ped so i don't know how he gets his story out but somehow he, i guess he writes a letter to the news the newspaper or a tv reporter here in uh West Des Moines and says, oh, hey, I was actually there the morning that uh, Johnny was kidnapped. Uh, I actually helped kidnap him and uh, we kidnapped him because uh, I was forced to work for a child sex ring. Okay, um, I'm pretty sure the reporter is having a slow news day and who knows? Maybe he could be telling the truth. Who knows? I, I'm sure we've heard weirder stories than this. Not many, but I'm sure we have. So the reporter meets up with him in prison and visits him. And he says all of these things. Somehow the uh, reporter puts him in contact or he gets into contact with Noreen, Johnny's mom. And... Possibly she went to the prison to go visit him or they called on the phone, whatever. So normally, you know, when you're a parent and you're at your wits end, it's almost been 10 years going on now that your child's been missing. I mean, maybe you'll entertain anything. I, I don't know. So she talks to this creep and uh, reportedly, uh, he says like yeah i you know i helped kidnap him i helped groom him 
and Johnny's still alive, he's in uh, forced prostitution. Now, if you're the mother, you would probably say, okay, uh, tell me something about my son that nobody would know. Now, granted, guys, there's been a lot of flyers and news, uh, milk cards, all that. So any uh, defining physical characteristics, scars, uh, stuff like that physically would have been printed on flyers. Now, Johnny had a birthmark on his chest. So Paul tells her, ah, yeah, he has a birthmark on his chest. Well, yeah, everybody knows he has a birthmark on his chest. However, he said two other characteristics that were not on any uh, newspapers that were not printed on any flyers. And that was that he had a, some form of a scar on his lower leg. Now, we all have scars, so maybe that could be just, you know, lucky guess, whatever you want to call it. But he says he also has a scar on his tongue. Nobody knew that Johnny Gosh had a scar on his tongue. And this, according to the mother, is what he told her. And he also said other things about Johnny that nobody would have known except the parents. I can't confirm or deny this. This is just what the mother said. Paul says, you know, when he gets angry or upset, uh, he stammers a lot while he's speaking. And both parents knew that when Johnny would get upset or frustrated or angry, that's what he would do. Okay, so you have one weird aspect of this case. So now, in Noreen's mind, I don't know about her husband, but her son is still alive and he's being held captive as some form of a sex slave. Now, it would be a couple years later where uh, finally uh, the Goshes got a divorce. So they ended up moving out of this neighborhood. The father, John, I think he moves out of state. Uh, he ended up retiring to Arizona and Noreen lives somewhere uh, somewhere northeast of here. Here's where the story gets progressively even more weird. So we're going to fast forward to March of 1997. Now, at this time, John and Noreen have divorced. So Noreen's in her home. It's about 2.30 a.m. and somebody's knocking on her door. Who the hell is knocking on my door? It's 2.30 in the morning. So she gets up, puts on her bathrobe, is saying, do look at the peephole, who's there, who is, you know, it could be a robber, I don't know. And according to her, this is her story. The guy behind the door says, mom, it's me, Johnny. Can you imagine as a, I can't even imagine the feeling that she felt when she heard that. She opens the door, she sees two guys standing on her doorstep. One was the guy that saying that he's Johnny, Johnny Gosh. He's wearing a dark jacket. His hair is up to about his shoulders and it's, a, it's dark, like almost like it's dyed black. He says, mom, it's me. Johnny. She's looking at them. I guess they go inside her home eventually after the shock wears off. They're sitting in the living room on the couch. And she says, prove it to me that you're my son. He opens his shirt and he shows her the birthmark that he had. Okay. Where the hell have you been? Oh my God, I thought you were dead. Probably saying all of that. And Johnny tells his mom, he says, I was kidnapped and forced into, I guess you would call it now human trafficking. And I'm putting myself in her position. I don't know what to say. So for the next hour to an hour and a half, they start talking. 
about what the hell happened, about the kidnapping, about what he's doing. And as he's talking, remember, there's a guy with him. They don't know who it is. He never identified himself. But every time, like, Johnny would start talking about this, this weird sex ring, he would look back at the other guy to almost like, is it okay uh, if I can say what I'm about to say? And she's saying, like, I want you to stay. Like, like we need to, you know, like, this is weird. And he, he tells his mom, he's like, I can't stay. It's too dangerous for me. Uh, I'm a slave. And supposedly, he gives his mom a hug. And with the other guy, turns around and walks out of her home. Now, common sense adults that are watching me right now, we're all listening to this story. Now, what would you guys do if this actually happened? You'd probably call the police, something along those lines. I'm not quite sure if she called the police. I'm fairly certain she did. And what are the police supposed to do with this information because by this time now johnny's already what 27 so you do what any mother would do you write a book about your experience in 2000 called why johnny can't come home now there's been a detective or two that has reportedly said that yes they were contacted about reportedly Johnny showing up to her home in 1997. I'm guessing they investigated it. I don't know. By this time now, this dude's an adult. If he is who he is, and there's really nothing that they can do about it. Now, like I said, she wrote that book in 2000 called Why Johnny Can't Come Home. The father, John Gosh Sr., doesn't really believe that happened. I don't know if he said, like, my ex-wife's a nutcase. I don't know. I don't know what other cops have said. I know there's been a documentary movie made about this. I didn't watch it. I don't like watching stuff that people have done about cases. I like to form my own opinions. I'm not saying I'm some detective. I just like to, you know, my own thoughts and ideas come from me. So coming back to this church where uh, on September 5th, 1982, Johnny had came to pick up his newspapers. I don't know. That's pretty much the end of the video. Uh, this is still an open case. Uh, police probably still continue to get leads every now and then. Johnny today, if he were alive, would be, what, 52 years of age? Be a middle-aged man. And as far as I know, both parents are still alive. And the mother might have taken back some of her statements concerning her claiming to have seen her son. Now, listen, I know what some of you guys are thinking. Could it have been some weirdo who knows about this case intimately and played a cruel joke on this poor woman and her pain and suffering? Did this woman possibly dream this up? Maybe she wanted it to happen. Listen, guys, I got to tell you, I don't have many children, but you tell me. What if you had a 12-year-old son and he disappeared and he never, ever came home? Maybe they're holding on to any bastion of hope. I don't know. This has got to be probably the top five weirdest uh, disappearances that I've ever read. Or at least top ten. And there's been two other kids along with Johnny Gosh that have disappeared from this area, three altogether since 1982. And that was uh, Eugene Martin 
and Mark Allen, and I believe one of those kids was actually a newspaper boy as well. And all three of these kids all disappeared and they've never been found since. I'm not sure what to make of it. I, I'll tell you this, both possible scenarios on what happened to Johnny Gosh are all bad. It's all bad. I don't even know which one would be the lesser of two evils. I mean, I don't know. Did the mother make this up for uh, publicity? Did the mother make it up in, for attention? Maybe she's lonely. Maybe she likes uh, people asking her questions about her son. Or maybe she made it up to get the investigation turning its wheels once again. And we all know this. Whatever city or county or wherever you live at, uh, the resources and manpower it takes to investigate uh, disappearances and unsolved crimes is always going to be severely underfunded. And videos like this, unsolved murders, crimes against people are what honestly drive me to do this channel and those are the videos that I care about the most and those are the videos that I only care about for people to share leave a comment below tell me what you think I don't know I don't know this is a very very unusual case to say the least Whatever, whatever happened, whatever happened, a 12 year old boy in 1982 was kidnapped and taken away from his family. And we could all agree, we could all agree that horrible things were done upon him. I'm Lamont at large. I will see you on the next video. I hope to anyways. Peace out.